other than living your life as a principled libertarian businessman, you also have a very strong record as a libertarian activist in, in spreading the cause of liberty in Australia. Um, back in 1970s, you, uh, you were involved in helping to establish and run Australia's first libertarian political party. I, I guess it was called Workers' Party? It was called the Workers' Party, sort of okay. laughingly, because we felt that we were the real workers. Mm -hmm. it was a, a, and it was, a, it was a difficult time that we had chosen. There was about ten. Ten people all around Australia that got together. Things were very, very bad politically in Australia, and we felt there was no choice between the two major parties. So we thought we'd start a new party. Um, uh, I remember the uh, some of them that were writing the, the the platform for this radical free market party decided to ring uh, Murray Rothbard, and the the noted student of Messi's. They rang him. They weren't quite aware of the difference, the time, the time, uh, mm -hmm. the time zone difference. <laughs> I think, well, I think we managed to get him out of bed about the three three a.m. in the morning. But he was uh, very excited to hear. He said, "I will help you. I will help you construct the platform because you will be the second libertarian party in the world." Wow. And, uh, naming the libertarian party in the U.S. was one with which he was involved. And that was back in 1975. No, yes, probably late 74, I think. And okay, we, before, we, before we, it and was we, we created. Actually, it was in 74 because I think we launched the Workers' mm -hmm. Party in 1975. Okay. It was officially launched. It was about a year working, working up to that, uh, putting it together. It was, um, it was a good exercise. We didn't get many people elected uh, into 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 politics, but it created a whole network of people who were brought to the free market economics. So it was beneficial yeah. after all. And, and those people are still there, and those people have moved on to sort of in very high places, and we still talk to each other, and we still, we still have reunions. <laughs> <laughs> it, it created a little bit of a radicalism in us, and it's made us very critical of the, the major two parties who are very soggy and very compromising in what they do, completely focused on the popular vote, mm -hmm. not on principles. Right, right. Well, that's the modern thing. That's what all political parties do today. It's a problem. In the past 16 years, however, um, you have been more involved educationally rather than politically through um, establishing and leading a free market think tank by the name Mancal Economics Education Foundation in uh, 1997. Uh, can you tell us something about that organization? Well, I think out of that earlier uh, political involvement, um, many of us uh, sat back and uh, we realized that there, re there really are four ways to become an activist. If you want to uh, involve yourself in change, you see radical change is needed, there really are four ways of doing that. Uh, one is the political method, which we tried uh, in the political party, and some people carried on in the political sphere. Some of us felt that education was probably a slower, uh, but in the longer term, probably bore more fruit as you <laughs> just trickle those ideas down through society. The third method was um, a peaceful... Uh, <clears throat> peaceful protest, uh, um, civil disobedience, uh, um, make some of the rulers look stupid by being carted off to jail uh, or not wearing seatbelts <laughs> and things like that. Uh, uh, that, uh, that was, some, of, some of us went in that direction uh, and I think the fourth, the fourth method for change is, is outright war <laughs> and uh, we were pretty pacifist in that sense so the war didn't uh, appeal to us. So there were the four methods and it brought quite a few of us to the educational method, and that's really where I've where I've stuck in a quiet. Where you, I'm an engineer at heart, and I like measuring results, and I can measure results. I, I measure the results from my efforts in the educational thing by looking at all the incredible letters I've received from young people, who mm -hmm. four or five years later they have written and said this happened in their life that they wouldn't have been perceptive enough to seize that opportunity without uh, some free market input and that it, it tunes 
it tunes your mind to be ready for these opportunities when they come. Uh, so that's that's where I've settled and that's uh, where we're having our major success at the, at the moment. And since it's educational, it, say it may not come to people right instantaneously, but later, as you said, later in life, yeah. it might come back, oh, hold on, this is the, the thing uh, that free market the marketeers are talking about. This is why it makes sense. It does, and it puts them in a position of being able to know when perhaps the university economics lecturers are talking nonsense, mm -hmm. <laughs> which which is often the case because the whilst they must be might be very good lecturers, the sort of economics that are being taught to the young people is the sort of economics that have that brought us the global financial crisis and have brought, us, have brought Europe down and have brought the USA down. That's the sort of economics that's still being taught in the universities. And when people say that, uh, that the problems of the GFC and why it's still lingering, these very same people say it's because we didn't stimulate enough, we didn't print enough money, we didn't create enough debt. Well, that makes about as much sense as, it, as to you as it does to me. The problem was debt in the first place. Never will you solve a problem by creating more debt. But this is being taught to the young people. I know they've got to learn it. I know they've got to pass exams. But I, all I can say, don't use that sort of economics to run your own business mm -hmm. or to run your own family or to run a country. The better form of economics is the free market economics, which engenders in it individual and personal responsibility for our actions without having anyone to bail us out. Uh, one of the ongoing project, projects of the Mancala Economics Education Foundation is sponsoring Australian students uh, with internships and free market think tanks around the world. Um, in what ways have these student experiences helped advance the cause of liberty at home in Australia? In other words, what have they brought back with them? Has it, has it sort of, uh, has, it, has it been a good return on investment? Well, uh, with my engineering background, again, I measure this. Five years ago, when we had various intern opportunities on offer, we had difficulty finding enough students to take up those opportunities. But now, when we advertise those opportunities, we get bundles. We had one, one opportunity, one, we wanted one student to go to the, don't laugh at this, but it was called the, the Austrian Economics Summit in Shanghai, China, about a year ago. And we had 40 applicants. And Ken and Lee Schooland? Exactly. It was wonderful. It, it was so good. It was so good that I went myself, <laughs> as, well, as okay. well as the student we said. Now, we got 40 people applied for that, and this is because those students that go come back and they become ambassadors, and when they hear about these other opportunities, they are like our talent scouts, and they go out, they find students and they say, hey, that was good for me. You should you should apply for this. You should sign up. And now it's the whole. It's not difficult finding students. We're just finding too many. And our challenge now is find is is expanding on the number of student opportunities to match the quality of the students and the quantity that we have lined up to go. So we've put more people on our staff. We're currently advertising for a CEO to take a lot of load off me, and. We are in expansion mode. So once they come back, uh, what are the sort of different ways they get involved? Do they, uh, uh, I mean, I guess sometimes they just go and in their own private lives, they, they go to business maybe, and they're not really always in touch with man -cow. They just do things on their own. Well, I'm surprised that uh, so many are in touch with us. There's absolutely no pressure. We're pretty busy doing what we're doing. We, oh, okay. don't, uh, we don't chase people up. <laughs> but we've got a network now. That's also part of the agenda for you yeah. to keep up with yeah. people, I guess. Yeah, yeah. well, we learn. From, uh, there's a benefit in us ah, keeping up with them because so we, we learn. <laughs> 
Ah, we okay. learn far more from them than they mm -hmm. learn from, <laughs> from you. And, and this is called, if you call this, it's called, could, could be called rational selfishness. They, uh, <laughs> I, I'm learning how they interact with each other, how they interact on social media, where a lot of people my age are really keeping right away from that space, but I find it fascinating, mm -hmm. fascinating seeing inside the minds of the next generation of leaders, because that's we rely on them to solve some of the problems of today <laughs> that we, our generations created for them. So, but uh, um, for probably to summarise all that, one might say that our success has been in choosing the quality of students that come back after being able to receive all this wisdom and these, these, this collection of various ideas and bringing it back and incorporating it in their philosophies of life our success in the quality of those people has now given us benefit that they are ambassadors and they are really recruiting the next year's mm -hmm. uh, internships and, and, and so it goes. You know, the reason I'm really asking about these kinds of questions because, you know, there are other, like back in the Balkans, we have organizations that do these kinds of things, trying to do these kinds of yeah. things, and they really need some, we need some input from others, yeah. you know, and we, you know, they don't really have much resources to travel around, to go to conferences and hear from others. So it's really uh, valuable for us to hear. We're involved in this learning process too, very much so, so that we are adding to the student experience. So that every year, if, uh, for instance, in Hong Kong, we, we, the students come up here and spend their six or eight weeks with the Lion Rock Institute but we've recently added on another dimension because of our involvement and membership of the Asia Society up here, which has got a wonderful facility that, that expresses in, 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 in very concrete terms the history of Hong Kong. Their add-on to that experience with the Lion Rock is spending some time at the Asia Society, learning about Hong Kong and the history of Hong Kong. And also when they go to the various Atlas Network uh, uh, events or the Cato Institute, we are now getting so good at finding what other events are on in that particular part of North America so we can take them from this conference to this seminar and, and add this experience. The major expense is the airfare to get them there and back. While they're there, let's add to their experience and give them value. So we must be always giving value to these students, otherwise the whole thing doesn't work. Right. Uh, Ron, you live a very busy life as, as a businessman, so how do you find time for all these things, for the cause of liberty? Well, you, you, uh, you, with some discipline, the people don't think I'm disciplined, but with some discipline I try to split it three ways. A third of my time, and that's very important, is earning a living. Because without generating an income, you can't indulge your passions. The worst thing in the world I could, for me to do would be to indulge my passions on borrowed money. Or just hope that somebody else would donate money so that I could indulge my passions. I've got to generate the, the, the wealth, the income to do that. So that's a third of my time. A third of my time is running the Mancal Foundation because that's my passion. And the other third of my time, which is a, a passion, uh, is, is writing. So I spend a third of my time writing, uh, bringing these thoughts together, uh, I think these thoughts, but you've got to get them out of here onto paper. Uh, and then you look at them again and you try to refine them. Like most writers, I write too much. <laughs> and somehow it's all in the editing. The secret of it, good editing is throwing away what other people refuse to read because it's, it's just too much. People don't want all that information. So you, if you can refine it down, and that's... That's the challenge for me to make, to tighten the stuff I'm writing, tighten it down, because people's attention span is shorter now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. Oh, absolutely. So that's the way you've got to, you've got to create the income to, 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 to feed 
your passions. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you you can't indulge yourself in the things that right. you and, really feel are important. And for us libertarians, we can't really rely on government because it's it would be against our principles. You can't say, oh, let's try to get a, get some funding from the government so that we can do all these things. So if the we, government wants to offer you some money, be suspicious. <laughs> And lastly, having been involved in the fight for the cause of liberty since the 1960s, and considering the, the present economic turmoils around the world, um, has the libertarian movement grown stronger and more, more influential over the time, in your opinion? Uh, and what future outlook do you envision for, for the cause of liberty? Well, that's probably another way of asking me if I would do all this again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had a little reunion of some of uh, the early uh, early pioneers of Australia's libertarian movement. We had that uh, uh, reunion in uh, in uh, in Brisbane, in Queensland, just recently. And uh, so many of us uh, asked ourselves the question, well, after all that, would we do it again? And we looked around and we saw the company in which we were keeping that night. We looked around into the faces of the people that we gathered there and we all agreed that yes, we'd do it all again because each of us have enriched the lives of each other. <laughs> and when you look back, that's the measure of a success. Who have you travelled life's experience with? People you respect, people you've learned from, the people you want to treasure as friends for the rest of your life? The answer is yes, I'll yes. do it again. <laughs> Ron, thank you very much for your time. It's a pleasure, yeah. Anytime.